What's up, everybody, and welcome to an off-season edition of the Falcons Final Whistle Podcast. I'm Scott Bear, along with Tori McElhaney. Ashton Edmonds is on assignment in Las Vegas, so this is going to be a two-person show and what will be the first of many off-season Falcons Final Whistles as we break down Falcons news as it comes, in addition to major tentpole moments throughout the course of this off-season, like the start of free agency, where the Falcons have a little bit of money or maybe... A wee bit. Yeah. A, wee a bit. lot more than they've had. That's for dang sure. <laughs> that, that's true. And then they're going to have the number eight overall pick and a number of quality opportunities to add talent. And we're going to talk to you at each stage through OTAs, through mini camp on towards the regular season. This is the kickoff of the off season, off season version of it. And Tori, do we have some news to discuss or what? That been, we do. There have been some changes on the defensive staff, most notably, the Falcons have a new coordinator after Dean Pease retired shortly after the season was over. The Falcons have ta- poked, poached, let's just say poached, Ryan Nielsen. <laughs> I thought you were going to say poked. They poked him. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about it and then I couldn't get the word out. They have hired, let's there just stick with the formal terms. They have hired Ryan Nielsen as their new defensive coordinator. They have also hired Jerry Gray, who has a long history with Arthur Smith as their assistant head coach defense. Uh, We're going to talk about each one of these guys individually. I think a narrative that hasn't really been addressed yet is you put these two gentlemen together, and I think you have a lot of good opportunities because you have Ryan Nielsen, who is going to call plays and is going to be in charge of this defense as a first-time coordinator, another young coordinator. Uh, aggressive, energetic coach added to the staff. And then you have Jerry Gray, who I think is coached for 35 <laughs> plus years and has been a coordinator twice and has been to the puppet show and seen the, seen the strings and knows what it's like to call a defense. I think those yeah. two guys together are really going to help the Falcons as they transition uh, after Dean P's retirement. Yeah, I think it's these two hires have been really intriguing Um, because I think it gives more information about what direction the Falcons want to go in, in the post Dean P's defense era in Atlanta. Uh, It's, I I agree with you about the Jerry Gray hire. I think that was a really important move for the Falcons. And that's not anything against Ryan Nielsen at all. I think Ryan Nielsen's a very intriguing decision at defensive coordinator as well. But what Jerry Gray can bring in terms of knowledge, in terms of experience, in terms, especially with the secondary, you think about Ryan Nielsen's strength. Ryan Nielsen's strength as a coach, as a play caller, is along that line of scrimmage. You need someone that you trust in the secondary. And who could you trust more than a guy with over 30 years of experience coaching defenses at this level? I I, I just think the the pairing of these two guys together, I completely agree with you that it that pairing is just as important as who the defensive coordinator was going to be. Yeah. So let's let's get into this Ryan Nielsen hire first. Um, again, he's, he's 43 years old. He's from USC. I'm a UCLA, UCLA alum. I won't hold that against him. I don't think <laughs> maybe though, he'll but, get along with Drake London so well swimmingly. Uh, yeah. but, but Ryan Nielsen comes in. He, if, if you didn't know his name and you had to search for it, did you have some fun features to dive over the, the, the yeah. athletic in particular, let's give credit where credits do Larry Holder yes. wrote a fantastic story. Yeah. Uh, J- Josh Kendall also chimed in with comments from he- Falcons head coach, Arthur Smith and Tori wrote kind of a five things to know s- summation of, if you don't know who Ryan Nielsen is, here's this guy. And yeah. what, like, what were some themes that you found Tori, as you were writing the news story and writing all these follow-ups and kind of building for Falcons fans, a greater and clearer picture of who their new defensive coordinator is. Yeah. So something that really struck me in everything that I read about Ryan Nielsen is his role as a player developer, which yeah. I thought is exactly what the Falcons need at this juncture and where they are. I loved reading, especially, I, I'm glad that you brought up Larry Holder's feature on Ryan Nielsen with The Athletic. I, if, you don't, if you don't know anything about Ryan Nielsen, I definitely recommend going and reading that story because that's where I really felt like I found the crux of who Ryan Nielsen is. And I also think that Scott and I should say 
we have yet to talk to Ryan Nielsen. He, yeah. <laughs> we haven't talked to him. We haven't met him yet. That will come probably when the Falcons get back from Las Vegas, which is where they are coaching the Shrine Bowl right now as we're recording this podcast. So there's still so much to learn about Ryan Nielsen in the direction that he wants to take the Falcons defense. But the one quote that I really hung on to and it's a quote hold on let me pull it up because i i wrote about it and because i pulled from uh larry holder's 2021 story on ryan nielsen and his emergence it was he was talking to defensive lineman carl granderson and what carl granderson said this quote was it just speaks volumes to me he said he focuses and is big on technique and effort he coaches pretty hard he wants us to be big nasty d linemen so we can go out there and destroy people you have to have tough skin in order to play d line for the new orleans saints that's the guy the falcons got and i think that's exactly and we'll get into more of this i think later in the podcast but that is exactly what arthur smith likes you think about who Arthur Smith is, finding big, nasty linemen where it's like tough to play at the line of scrimmage for these coaches because you know how hard they're going to push you. That is, that's the crux of, I think, what the Falcons are trying to establish. We look at what they did offensively in the run game this year. They want to establish that run stopping, men, dirty, nasty front along the defense line. And they know that that has to be an area of improvement. They've talked about it ad nauseum that they have got to get a push up front along this defense line. Yeah. They in areas where they struggled the pass rush, obviously and pass defense in general, they went out and they got guys who are really good at creating those types of things. Yeah. Uh, and Ryan Nielsen has been very good about that. So Tori, let me just say this, but Tori, I've seen the saints play and he runs a four, three. How can he possibly <laughs> be a fit here? Because if you look at how the, I mean, Cam Jordan is a um, uh, freak of nature, right? He's, he's a monster in he's the 280 best pounds, way. right? Yeah. And he's just, he's quick and athletic and complimenting saints is not what we normally do on this podcast, but <laughs> credit where credits do here. But, and Trey Hendrickson, uh, who worked with, with Ryan, Nies with Ryan Nielsen as well, is not a small individual. And you think about Arthur Smith and Terry Fontenot talking about the quote unquote hybrid model and hybrid model player. Um, did it give you pause that they went with a more quote unquote prototypical four three guy? I mean, Arthur Smith said on Monday, I do laugh uh, about the four three or three four thing. Yeah. Um, you know, and basically said, if you watch base defense, they obviously have five guys up at the line of, of scrimmage, call it whatever you want. You can call that, that guy on the end of the line an open side end, a Jack linebacker. It doesn't matter what you call it, but I do think he's right though, that, yeah. I mean, even the Falcons last year, some played like a, sometimes they played like a two, three, exactly. Every, and that whatever was, number you get to 11, you know? Right. And that's kind of where I was when they made this hire and everybody's freaking out, like, oh my gosh, we don't have the personnel to run what Ryan Nielsen wants to run. It's like, well, if you look at what Dean Pease was running, he was running literally anything and everything in terms of fronts. You right. Like what you said, you sometimes saw Grady Jarrett standing up. Like, I, don't, like <laughs> you, I know that's not a, a defensive front, but I'm just going to say like Grady Jarrett was standing up sometimes. Like, and I, I really do think you saw them with a traditional three, four look. You saw them with this traditional four, three look. You saw them in a four, two, five. I mean, there were so many different things that they did anyways, that I do think that it, it to say like, oh, Ryan Nielsen only runs a four, three. Well, the best coordinators coordinate and plan for the players that they have. And 100. I think that goes back to the opportunities that the Falcons have with free agency. They could go out and get guys who fit more towards what Ryan Nielsen has been running with the Saints. I think just because they went out and got a guy who has a 4-3 baseline run stopping mentality like the Saints have had over the last seven years, uh, I think that that doesn't discount what the Falcons could bring in and do in Atlanta this off season, I think this defense is going to look very, very differently because I think that they now have the resources and the money to pump into this defense. And I think in terms of fronts, like I completely agree with Arthur Smith. And I think even talking to Dean Pease in the many conversations we had with him over the two years that he was in Atlanta, I think Ryan Nielsen would say the same things like fronts are flexible. 
fronts are always changing. I mean, just because one thing works against one formation, offensive formation doesn't mean that it's going to work with another one. I mean, this is all the game. Arthur Smith talks all the time, the games within the games. Well, this is just another part of it. And I don't think that Falcons fans should be absolutely freaking out to be like, oh my God, like we're turning into the Saints or whatever. Ryan Nielsen is going to come in and do kind of what Ryan Nielsen wants to do. We also have to think about like, yes, he was the co-defensive coordinator with the Saints, but that who who's calling plays on Dennis game day? Allen. Dil, Dennis Allen, exactly. So that also, what, what does Ryan Nielsen want to do when he has the control of a defense? I mean, these are all questions that we're going to have the opportunity to answer. So I'm not ready to be like, oh my gosh, we're completely getting away to, from what the Falcons have built the last two seasons. No, I actually think we're going to see more of it kind of come to clarity this yeah. between this off season. Yeah. And, and we are recording this on a Tuesday and you're right. We, we haven't heard from Ryan Nielsen. I'm sure that he's going to uh, kind of brush off the notion of a base defense one way right. or the other. And I, I think that ultimately they can mold and shift because they talk about the hybrid model, right? Well, mm -hmm. you needed some more heft up front, no matter what, no matter who the coach was. That's the thing. It's like, you really did. When we were looking at, I think I was the one that wrote like the defensive line, like positional review that we, we did all mm -hmm. the positional reviews throughout the month of January. The Falcons need help in the interior defensive line, however way you cut it, like however way you look at it, they were going to need help because outside of Grady Jarrett, Taquan Graham got hurt. Marlon Davidson wasn't on the, isn't on the team anymore. Anthony Rush isn't on the team anymore. All of the guys that started out the 2022 training camp season, the guys that you ended up with at the end, so Timmy Horn and Jalen Dalton and Abdullah Anderson, nothing against those guys at all, but you knew how much interior defensive line was going to be a priority, if not the number one priority, going into free agency and the draft. That doesn't change because a new offensive coordinator comes in here. Yeah, and I mean, needs are still needs, and the and the volume of talent that needs to join this defensive front, especially with some maybe patchwork or some additions uh, in the defensive backfield are also important despite mm -hmm. the fact and i don't think that we have to say all right they're going away from what dean p set up here i i think a lot of the mentality and and a lot of the uh not accepting mediocrity and a lot of the performance on critical downs like that doesn't leave you as an individual and if you can get better as a front I think it, it just changes the entire dynamic. So that's, I think that's Tori and I's long winded way of saying, <laughs> let's not get hung up in the four, three, three, four ness of it. Yeah. Let's also not just rest on our laurels and say automatically everyone, just if we're going to try to play it honestly here, not everyone who fit exactly what Dean P's like to do and was a role player they may not have the same role that there is some natural transition here it's yeah. not just dean pease that's gone it's 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 ted monachino it's john hoke you know gary um, emmanuel gary emmanuel so there will be some different philosophies there will be some new things coming into this defense and i think it'll be interesting to see who these other new hires are going to be, how Ryan Nielsen calls plays. We really don't have a good grasp of that. And what can he do with that defensive front? Say what you, I, I know Falcons fans don't like to compliment saints. Saints have a good defense. And as they you do. pointed out, have for a long time yeah. and under Ryan Nielsen, even as a position coach, we're really good at getting pressure and, I promise this won't be a long rant, Tori, but mo the thing that I like about what they do is they get pressure with four. Now you need yeah. talent, right? But if you can get pressure with four, it changes everything. And I think that that's what their ultimate goal is. I asked Arthur Smith about that. And he says like, that's the ideal scenario. And if you can get pressure rushing four, and you have, and Ryan Nielsen has proven that he can do that with the right talent. We'll go find the, the right talent and become that type of tough defense that you've faced in new Orleans over the last three or four seasons. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think all that is, is going to be fascinating. And I think it's going to be really interesting once we hear from him, right? That we're dealing with this podcast. We're, we're, we're talking a lot about what we've read and what we've learned by observing, but we haven't really heard from him yet. 
And then right. that's going to be a learning point. And then we're going to learn some more when we see him engage with players and then the player's reaction to it. And then a little bit more after the preseason when he actually calls a play that's not generic. And right. that's going to be interesting. So this is a long learning process. Um, they interviewed a lot of good candidates and they were really sold on this guy, which I think because we've, we, we, we've talked about Jerry Gray already, Tori. Mm -hmm. So let's, so let's skip to this next part, which is your idea and your point here, maybe about kind of why this was the guy and why Arthur Smith said specifically on Monday that he was a quote unquote fit. Yeah. So this is an idea that I had just when I was doing the research for the story that I wrote about like five things to learn about your new defensive coordinator. And this was kind of the moment that really sparked an and a story idea for me, and it's one that I'm going to play around with and hopefully have a, a more in-depth piece for you guys to really read, essentially, and we can talk more about it later, too, but because I haven't talked to Ryan Nielsen. I haven't talked to Arthur Smith about this hire, so for me, this is all just my opinion, but my opinion is that the Falcons went with Ryan Nielsen because he strikes me as an Arthur Smith guy, and here, here's what I say about that. Arthur Smith is an offensive lineman. He played offensive line at the University of North Carolina. At the almost exact same time, Ryan Nielsen is on the West Coast at USC playing defensive line. And he did that at the college level. Then they both, you know, grow up and they become coordinators and go go through all of, all of the coaching hoops and hurdles. But the crux of who they are, they are hard nose, intense, and they want dirty, nasty linemen, exactly kind of what that initial comment was from Carl Granderson. I fully believe that that intensity, that whole idea of winning the game and living and dying at the line of scrimmage is what sold Arthur Smith on Ryan Nielsen and what sold Ryan Nielsen on Arthur Smith. Because to me, they're kind of cut from the same cloth. They have kind of a similar thing at the line of scrimmage that makes them tick and for me I think that's really exciting because we saw in training camp and in the preseason how hard Arthur Smith pushes the offensive line particularly that specific position what we saw was an offensive line in 2022 that outplayed expectations and let's be honest did really well the run blocking of this unit they started out I think it was pro football focus, which take that with a grain of, grain of salt as it is, but they had them ranked, I think it was 30th as an offensive line before the season started. They were a top five offensive line pick by the end of the season. There was obvious growth at the, at the line of scrimmage for this offensive line. Now you need that to translate to the defensive line and who better to do that than a guy who has a similar mentality and similar thought process to Arthur Smith. So that's kind of just like, where my mind is at and kind of my hypothesis as to why they went with Ryan Nielsen in the first place. I see from every, all the research points that I've had, I see a very serious and clear, I don't know, like picture of mm -hmm. why Arthur Smith would like a guy like Ryan Nielsen and why he would think that he fits in Atlanta. And you, we heard so much of Terry Fontenot and Arthur Smith talk about, they were referring to, acquiring players and free agency mm -hmm. and the draft, but they were talking about not just finding talent, but finding fits. Mm -hmm. Why would that not apply to the coaching staff? Why exactly. would it's the exact same type of thing is that you need talented guys, everyone that they brought in, whether it was reported or not, you have to be talented as a defensive mind, or you're not going to get that higher. Or, or, or you're not going to get that interview, but how do you sift through all of the schemes and all of the ideas and the imagination and the creativity without taking a look at what you're trying to find in your players? Do you want a good locker room environment? And you want guys that fit your ethos to borrow Arthur's <laughs> term? Why would you not do that? Arthur in, and Terry. <laughs> yeah, Arthur and Terry. Then why would you not do that within the coaching staff? Those guys spend mm -hmm. like 95 hours a week together. So uh, that's what I think we have support for your hypothesis, Tori. And it's something that I, I think when you look at this Jerry Gray edition too, is that you've got a guy with history with Arthur Smith 
a, mm -hmm. a, a prolonged history, both in Washington, going back to the mid 2000s. And then again, in Tennessee, when Arthur was briefly on the defensive side of the ball, technically working under Jerry Gray. Right. So there's got to be a good mutual respect there. And not only does he have experience calling plays, you talk about what Ryan Nielsen does well, it's the front. Well, Jerry mm -hmm. Gray was a darn good defensive back in his own right and a pretty right. good defensive backs coach for a long time. So you're starting to see the plan kind of come out and emerge here. We still don't have the complete staff. Ryan Nielsen's going to have a say in a lot of that. And I think that's important. And you would expect mm -hmm. that Ryan Nielsen's going to have a say in the, in the type of player that works for him. That's how Falcon scouting works. They go mm -hmm. out and they interview the coaches and they say what do you like to do what it, like like what like what traits do you like there's no disconnect on this staff so they're going to do that with with ryan nielsen and they're going to go out and find terry a collection of players that fits what the schematics like to do and thinking long term back to what terry said in his post season press conference was using the ravens model not the ravens defensive schematics scheme as a model but using the fact that they continue to cycle in the type of player that that they like and that defense mm -hmm. is good regardless of coordinator yep. right that in an ideal world as a coaching staff the head coach remains stable and the gm remains stable and the assistants because you win like what we're seeing with D'Amico Ryans and Vic Fangio mm -hmm. out in San Francisco, that those guys get head coaching jobs. Well, then you got to bring somebody else in, but you have to sustain that level. So that's the ultimate long-term goal. And I think that, look, everybody knows who Vic Fangio is. Everybody knows who Brian Flores is. Maybe fewer people know who Ryan Nielsen is, but I think that you should be intrigued to learn more about this guy. And yeah. that's what, again, we're going to develop here. We don't have all the answers right now. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to until we continue to get these um, additional points. And Tori, before we kind of wrap this thing up here, and this is way, 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 way too early, but I'm going to ask you the question anyway, right? <laughs> that when you look at the success that the Saints defensive front had, and then you and then you think, oh, okay, Marcus Davenport's going to be on the market. Oh, I'm going to mess up the pronunciation of his last name, but David Onimata is going to be on the open market. That's a defensive tackle that they need somebody in, in, in those spots. I'm not saying this is going to become saints North East, but I think that you have to try to take a look at in free agency. Look, you want talent and good value. Sure. Yep. But if you have a guy who knows the system that that's at least attractive, or it may raise him up on the list of possibilities, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, I would think so. I mean, you think about all the decisions that the Falcons have made even in coaching and in, I mean, we look back at the last two years of bringing in players and they bring in players that they have a history with. They bring uh, in yeah, players that's true. that they like. They bring in players that have ran in their system before, who they've worked with before. So I don't think it's out of the question that these guys are on their radar. At the exact same time though, it's like, where, what, where are you putting that value on those guys? Are you putting, cause they are, I say older players. I don't, right. I don't, I feel bad being like, oh, they're old at like 27 as I just turned 27 and I'm not old. And so <laughs> having an existential cri existence crisis, but it's fine. Um, but with that being said, it's like, where are you exactly what you're saying? Like, where are you putting the value in what you're wanting and trying to build and how long are you willing to wait to be competitors? I mean, the Falcons, I think the, I mean, again, this is really far in the distance. I feel like I'm speaking, uh, this may be too soon to say this, but don't the Falcons want to be playoff contenders in 2023? Sure. Who do you want to go and get who you feel like can put you in the best spot to be that? Is it, guy, or it, it, is it guys who know your system, know what you want, have worked with you before, who can go out there and execute what you want because they, they know you. Is that, the, is that the guy that you want? Or do you want to develop guys? Do you want to kind of have these young guys be sponges and absorb? And yeah, you'll go through growing pains, but you're ultimately getting kind of what you put into them. Yeah, I mean, that's, I, the, that's the question, right? No. Like that's the question that you, you have to ask yourself if you're Falcons decision makers. Yeah. And we're not trying to offer answers or bold predictions here. We're just saying how the logic changes and how 
you know, the Falcons are going to think about things as they continue to make decisions. The, the first two decisions have been made regarding the coaching staff. They're obviously evaluating talent at the Shrine Bowl in Vegas and at the Senior Bowl in uh, Mobile. Mm-hmm. I think either way, we've seen two decisions made. We're going to see a lot more decisions made in terms of in, in investment and asset use yeah. and the way that they flesh out the staff. And all of those things are going to give us a little bit more of a clue into where they're going and what their priorities are and what they think and what we think their needs are. I feel like on this podcast, I've said 12,000 times that any, that any transaction made is worth more in telling you what the Falcons want or are going to do than any podium trip. It's just the way it is. Thousand percent. (laughs) Yes. And that's not because Arthur and Terry are not insightful or forthcoming. It's the fact of the matter that this is a competitive business. And why would you Mm -hmm. give away what you're going to do when it's a competitive business? Um, So nonetheless, I, I, I just think that these are two intriguing hires off the top. It'll be fascinating to hear from to hear from Ryan Nielsen when his inevitable press conference comes to be and to see how this defense develops. The first die has been cast right? And now what happens after that is going to be just as important and just as intriguing. But we felt like with the first Falcons final whistle podcast, now that we have that first, whatever domino, I don't know, pick your analogy, um, (laughs) that that we were finally able to kind of say, okay, here's a small sign of where they're going to go. Where are they going to go next? Yeah. And I mean, we'll be there every step of the way. We have a long off season ahead. I mean, and seriously, I keep saying this over and over and people probably are so tired of me saying it, but like, this off season is the crux of where the Falcons go under Terry and Arthur period. Like yeah. to me, this, the last two years have been building to this off season, this off season. I can't stress the import. Uh, I can't stress enough the importance of this off season. And I think expectations and the way that you look at the Falcons should change after this off season. Mine will, I can tell you that right now. And the good thing is, is we'll be along for the ride, wherever yeah. that ride takes you which and is, us. <laughs> <laughs> which, which is why uh, it'll take us to Indy for the combine and pro days yes. and uh, everywhere else in between. And uh, we, and again, Ashton Evans is out there working hard at the Shrine Bowl. So mm-hmm. keep an eye out for more articles on that. We have a couple on Charles London and the importance of the Senior Bowl. So we got you covered from every step. And that's why Falcons Final Whistle, which was originally designed many moons ago to be a post-game podcast, had just become uh, the Off-Season Never Stops podcast. Um, <laughs> maybe we should change the name. But anyway, uh, I'm Scott. That's Tori. Appreciate the time. And we will talk to you again really, really soon. Bing bong.